On this episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show, we are live on site at the ICUS Society meeting in the Bahamas. Uh, we got a great episode here. I have Lenny Macrina obviously here as ICUS Society member, but we're joined by Phil Page, Lane Bailey, and Mike Mullaney, some great physical therapists around the country. And they're gonna share, share with you some of the research that they've been doing on some uh, ACL type concepts and Achilles repair rehabilitation. So great episode from the ICUS Society. The Ask Mike Reinhold Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reinald Show. I'm actually here. We're live on location at the ICUS Society meeting in uh, Atlantis, Bahamas. It's actually pretty interesting. But Lenny and I get to uh, interview some great people on the, on today's uh, podcast episode, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we're at the ICUS Society meeting. Uh, ICUS is this society of sports physical therapists. There's about, I don't know, 36, mm -hmm. 38 or so of us now that we get together once a year and we talk about some of the, the latest resources research trends that we're doing and things that we want to share with you guys. Um, it's kind of like our, the, the beginning of our thought process for, for a lot of the things that we're doing in our clinics and researching, stuff like that. So uh, we're going to talk about a couple of the presentations that were uh, done at the meeting today. But let me introduce everybody, of course, so Lenny Macrina, as you guys all know, many people's favorite character, right, <laughs> on the show. We're good. Phil Page, Director of Research for Performance Health Academy. Did I, did I nail that? Nailed it. Pretty good. So Dr. Phil Page uh, is here joining us as well. Uh, Lane Bailey we have from um, where, where, Memorial. Memorial Herman. Yeah. Memorial Herman in, <laughs> in, in, in Houston, but director of research, obviously. So does a great job. He's down there in Houston with a bunch of our other colleagues like Russ Payne and Dr. Lowe and stuff. So it's, it's great. Mike Mullaney from New York as well. So he's a research consultant at the Nicholas uh, Sports Medicine Institute and has a private practice in New Jersey. So, um, so anyway, so that's the group. What we really wanted to talk about is these two guys, to be honest with you, just had two amazing presentations that we wanted to ask them questions so you guys can kind of benefit there. Maybe we'll start with Mike first. But Mike gave an amazing presentation on Achilles repair rehabilitation. Um, and what I really liked about the presentation was you, um, you kind of took some old data that you had and found some of the holes or some of the things that, that didn't go quite well and try to modify that. And, and namely, some of the issues with stiffness, and, and strength after Achilles repair and really, you know, how we can change that. So, Mike, why don't you summarize a bit of your research and maybe kind of give the, uh, the listeners a little bit of a, of a review. Sure. So back in uh, 2006, we, uh, we did a, re a, uh, a research study on uh, post-op Achilles, and we want to look at their strength uh, considering the history of elongation in tendons. And so we went and we tested their strength at different ranges of motion, did a series of functional tests, and we found there was significant end range weakness and a loss of passive stiffness in the Achilles. So from that, we decided we would try to, over the next 10 years, we would change our rehab a little bit. We'd have surgeons did another uh, type of surgery, uh, an extra augmentation to the, to the Achilles. And then we decided as therapists, we were no longer going to stretch our patients we were our thought process was that way maybe we were helping to elongate the achilles <clears throat> so we changed our rehab process and then last year we did our follow-up study 10 years later we retested all of them did the same exact thing we did the first time and we found that unfortunately they still had end range weakness so we did not impact that at all um, sadly but the one thing we did impact is that we we made the stiffness of the tendon the same side to side so we felt like at least maybe we didn't over elongate it, um, but unfortunately the, the, the bottom line is that um, we really still have a, a lack of end range strength in plantar flexion, which is uh, probably not a concern for you know the washed up weekend warrior, but I think when it comes to the high level professional athlete who has to jump and leap, it's probably going to be an issue. Yeah. So, so a couple of things that I thought were super interesting. So one was, I mean, they changed their rehab protocol to stop doing passive stretching completely after Achilles repair. So um, that's, to me, that was a big one because they found that there were changes in stiffness uh, down the road. So they were, you know, they wondered, well, maybe we're overstretching doing that. So they changed it, no, no stretching, and they, you still had issues with stiffness, right? Like it still didn't really help. So we have that then plus, you know, you know can we imp improve that strength, that end range? Because what they found essentially was strength at, at, in, a, in a dorsiflex position versus a plantar flex, flex position ha had different outcomes with the study. And that, that was super interesting. 
interesting how you know you could do well in one position but not in another. Right. Yeah. So uh, with the elongation of the tendon, the tendon has been shown to elongate over a period of 12 weeks postoperatively. So we thought, well, let's take that out of our stretching. Let's take our stretching out of our protocol for that first 12 weeks. And all the studies that show elongation, we decided, you know. Um, if that's when it's stopping, the elongation stopping, let's not stretch and try to accelerate the elongation. Um, you know, that's where we think when we get into that plantar flex position, when you're all the way plantar flexed, I mean, we're seeing deficits up to 20, 30 percent you know, end range, which is, that's pretty significant. And, you know, I can see 5, 10, but, and, you know, these guys are two, three years out. So it's, it's pretty significant. So, yeah, from a, um, a rehab stamp, standpoint, that's kind of our baseline now is we do not stretch. Um, for the first 12 weeks at all. Wow. So, so no stretching for the first 12 weeks after Achilles repair and a greater emphasis towards probably strengthening in a plantar flex position. So, so towards more end range of plantar flexion to me sounds good. Um, so, I, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, so what, what can we do different to get that strength up? I mean, that's the interesting question. We didn't rehearse this, obviously. Uh, so, um, you know, what, how, how, do we get, how do we get strength up? Well, I think what's interesting <clears throat> was that elongation didn't really affect anything so we're so focused on not trying we're trying to prevent excessive elongation but the people that you studied 10 years later still had issues with strength so we're missing something completely right now and then you even presented emg studies that showed emg findings were pretty normal compared to baseline or compared to the normal uh gastroc so we're, we're missing something completely. And I think we talked about it in the group that maybe it had something to do with the amount of tissue, the, that, uh, the, the, the size of the tendon that develops after the repair. Maybe that's affecting the pull on the gastroxoleus complex and not allowing them to get that end range strength gains back. So I think there's still, as much as we think we know, we, I think we still it opened up this can of worms now of what, what could still be causing the deficits in strength. And I think very interesting is the size of the tendon that is resulting in it. I think you guys are going to look at that. Maybe the people that were weak had a bigger, I guess, wad of tendon tissue that had developed and maybe that prevented them from getting the, I don't know, it's just a theory of mine, but you know, I don't know if anybody else wants to take the mic and Sing away, or I guess I'll take yeah. <laughs> yeah. a couple yeah. questions at a time. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think that's a key component. Uh, a couple things, uh, just to comment. I, I think um, when we think about end range plantar flexion, I, I don't think it's something that we think about on a regular basis when we rehab people. We don't put them in a plantar flex position and make them contract. It's something that I think that we have sort of, um, or I should say at least in our practice, we've really tried to increase it, you know, really focus on that. And even if they can't do it, do it in a little bit more of a, you know, whether you can eliminate some of the weight that, that's on them. You know, one of the things, if you have somebody do calf raises at the bottom of a leg press, you know, are they really ever getting to full plantar flexion? No, they're bouncing. They bounce up and down, and they're probably within 10 degrees of plantar flexion, 10 degrees of dorsiflexion, right? They're never getting the 20 or 30 degrees. They don't focus on it. You know, so I think that's definitely something. But to go to, back to you, uh, Lenny, is, is yeah, that, that thickness, our, the, the tendons were seven millimeters thicker on the involved side, you know, and we talked about it, and, you know, it's something we'll go back and look at is the inability of the calf to contract because of that huge piece of tissue there, it's there. And then we talked about also is that, um, you know, the Achilles itself is, it, it, it rotates 90 degrees from, um, from the soleus down to the heel, but, you know, I don't know any surgeon who spins the tissue in there and sews it back down the way it should be. So there's a sense of uh, loss of that recoil in our Achilles. And, and you know, so, uh, you know, if it's the tissue or if it's their lack of recoil from not being rotated, you know, I don't know if we'll ever really know the answer, but, you know, some of the things I think we have to consider. Cool. So awesome. One, one thing yeah. real quick. So yeah. just a question then. Do you think based on the fact that you said uh, you need to strengthen in a more shortened position, you don't want to elongate it. What if you just simply bent the knee? and made sure you did everything with the knee bent when you were doing plantar flexion exercises. Would that protect you a little bit? Uh, anybody else want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you there. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. How, how, do you think that would, how do you think that would shorten the, the calf would, more? It would prevent over elongation. From the gas. From the gas drop, you mean? Yeah. I, I guess, you know. Would that help you at all? No, nah, you know, that's a good idea. It's, a, it's, a, it's another thought. Um, but then, you know, when are you going to work your gas drop, though? You're still gonna have to work your gas truck sure at some point. To some degree, right. It's not, you know, fully yeah. protecting it. Yeah. You know, so I don't think that you're totally isolating the muscle by doing it in this slight deflection. Sure. Too late. Too, Too late. Sorry.
This is, this is different for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, but point well taken. I, you know, I think it's something to consider. Maybe we, we need to do a little bit more work. And, and I mean, it, how many soleus exercises do you guys do when you're rehabbing somebody? <laughs> right. This is the, I mean, unless you, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a difficult muscle to, to exercise over and over and over. We don't have that many choices in exercise there. Well, I think to piggyback on this, we had some earlier discussions, I think, for the audience. We, we were talking about other modalities and blood flow restriction came up. This may be a specific population uh, f for, you know, those individuals to actually get some stress through the muscle or at least create the chemical environment from some of the basic science literature that we know to hopefully precipitate and mitigate some of that strength loss that, that we see down the road. But just a thought, I think we're going to have to find out a lot more before we can come to any conclusions. Nice, awesome. All right, well, let's shift gears, keep going with Lane then. I like this. So Lane at his center in Houston is doing an amazing database um, of all their post-operative patients. And they just, they have, they're, they're tracking a lot of different things, trying to make a difference on some of the efficacy of what we do in rehab. So one thing that Lane talked about today was some of the things they're doing with ACLs and stuff. And Lane, why don't you just share with everybody some of your, your research you found. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> we've been fortunate. Uh, I've been at this institution for about three and a half years, and it's a, a pretty large, high-volume uh, clinic, specifically with ACLs. Our, uh, our medical director is, is Dr. Walt Lowe, and he does a large, large number of ACLs per year, probably in the range of 400, um, <clears throat> which is a good opportunity as a, a clinician scientist, clinician researcher, to hopefully capture a lot of that, that information. So we've, we've got a good system in place where we're bringing those patients in on a monthly basis to collect uh, clinical functional measures as well as subjective surveys, things of that nature, so that we can sort of plot recovery over the course of, of rehabilitation so that we can have a better understanding, one, you know, where, where folks should be at any phase of that recovery, hopefully down the road, and then be able to stratify based on demographic factors, surgical factors, things that would influence uh, a patient's recovery. Uh, and I think, you know, we can all probably list uh, um, a myriad of those, but we're trying to capture some of that data. Um, but specifically with one of the studies that, that, that we, we discussed earlier, we, we looked at uh, different block types uh, with ACL reconstruction. So I'm, I'm sure there's a, a number of them out there, but femoral nerve block happens to be very popular. Our center just started doing adductor canal nerve blocks, and that was precipitated uh, through sort of an effort to mitigate you know, the problems that we have with, with quad muscle weakness and quad muscle activation deficits. So we tried to, uh, try to determine, you know, does an adductor canal nerve block help us get the, the quad going sooner? And so the mechanism behind that is the femoral nerve block takes out the afferent and the efferent pathways, whereas the adductor canal spares the motor unit. So hopefully you're getting a little bit more quad activation early, and that's always the big deficit we're trying to overcome. So the research that we did looked at some of the acute effects within the first four to six weeks uh, and showed that the activation uh, patterns were, were better and more beneficial at uh, the first 24 hours and two weeks out after after surgery, but at four weeks, they, they tended to normalize. So the adductor canal looked very similar to the femoral nerve block group. Um, and then at six months, we did, we did a longer term follow-up and, and for all of our biodex, isokinetic testing, all of our functional testing, we, we really couldn't find any differences between the groups. So it seems to be at least uh, an early benefit. Uh, long-term doesn't seem to, to hold up. Uh, we're currently going back and looking at our database to see what the complication rates are between those two groups and, and if there's a difference in how those patients are progressing through, uh, for an example, you know, how many of those patients had to go on and get um, any intervention for patellar tendonitis or a manipulation under anesthesia due to extension loss or flexion loss, just things that may play, play a role in that recovery. We wanted to be able to document and track that. Uh, but right now, again, it, it seems to, to be an early benefit, but maybe not a long-term benefit. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, heck, I think this is the tip of the iceberg of some of the research that we're going to be getting from Lane and, and all this information that they're collecting there. So uh, we're super excited about, you know, hearing more. So definitely keep an eye out for Lane Bailey. He's going to do some fantastic stuff and probably be, you know, publishing a bunch of stuff on uh, from this database and much, much more from Houston. Mike Mullaney's study, I'm sure at some point we'll start seeing down the road. So uh, it was awesome. So thanks, guys. Phil, appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much, you guys. Uh, thanks for joining us on another awesome episode episode uh go to mike click on that podcast link and you can ask us questions we'll answer all those questions next time and go to itunes rate and review and we'll see you guys on the next episode